Well, I want to welcome you. Uh, some of you welcome you back. The rest of you welcome uh, for the first time today to uh, St. Norbert College and the Sports and Society, Sports in America Conference, which, uh, which this year is uh, focused on women in sports. And we've been off to a great start. And uh, I know we're going to have a, a, a great finish here here tonight for uh, today's programming. Uh, it is a real honor for us to be here tonight uh, to have on campus um, Muffet McGraw, who is going to talk about women in leadership. Uh, I think you would agree with me that she is definitely qualified uh, to handle that subject. Uh, Coach McGraw has just finished her 27th season as head women's basketball coach at the University of Notre Dame, a season that included a trip to the national championship game. Indeed, under Coach McGraw, the Fighting Irish have made four trips to the NCAA Division I national championship game. She led Notre Dame to the 2001 national championship by beating Purdue in the title game. And if I may, as a native of Indiana myself, that game gave me, um, an especial, made me especially proud. Her team, in fact, has been to 21 NCAA tournament appearances, including a current string of 19 consecutive tournament berths, the sixth longest active run and eighth longest streak at any time in NCAA tournament history. In 2011, Coach McGraw became the first representative of Notre Dame to be inducted into the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. Obviously, Coach McGraw is not someone to be trifled with. She told us this morning she's a native of Philly, so maybe that explains it. So please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Coach Muffet McGraw. Thank you. It's really a pleasure to be here tonight to talk a little bit about women in sports. And I'm so thrilled to have the All-American Baseball team here because they were truly the pioneers that got this going. Uh, you know, a long time ago, I read a book, you probably heard of it, and it was called something like, Everything I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. If I was writing a book now, I think I would call mine, everything I needed to know about life, I learned from playing sports. Discipline, teamwork, sacrifice, a great work ethic, and how to be a leader. These are great things that women are learning from playing sports. When I was growing up, women were just starting to get opportunities. Back in the 70s, we didn't have a lot of female role models that we could look up to and say, that's what I want to be. My first opportunity to play basketball was in the seventh grade, and I was a little disappointed when I found out that we didn't play the exact same game the boys were playing. We had to play six on six. We had two forwards at one end on offense only. We had two guards on defense at the other end. They couldn't cross half court, and we had two rovers that got to run back and forth. Well, this was a game that was invented by men who thought that childbirth was a pain-free experience, but running up and down a court, that might make us faint. <laughs> As if playing a different version of the game wasn't bad enough, we had to do it while wearing a skirt. Lest we forget our femininity. Well, in seventh grade, I was about four foot ten. I weighed about 75 pounds. I wore these really ugly cat-eye glasses that my mom swore were made just for me. And when we would go out to start the game at center court, the other team would fight over who was going to get to guard me. I think that's when I started to develop my competitiveness, but I got a good start on that at home too, because I come from a big family, and when you have eight kids and seven pork chops, you gotta learn to move fast. <laughs> I used to watch the NBA, and I would try to emulate their game. They were my role models. So I would go out to practice and try to do everything that they did. My goal in those days was to be the first woman in the NBA. Well, I didn't make that one, but I did get to play in the first women's pro league. I played for a team called the California Dreams, so the first thing I did was go out and buy my husband a t-shirt that said, my wife is a dream. <laughs> when I was playing in college, we used to have to wait till the men got off the court before we could practice. In fact, they practiced whenever they wanted to for as long as they wanted to, and then we got the court. We didn't get sneakers. We didn't have practice clothes. Uh, in fact, we had to buy our own shoes. We had to wash our own practice clothes. We had to drive ourselves to the away games 
and it was not quite the fans that we have now. We had probably maybe 40 or 50 people watching our games, and our coach's philosophy was recruit players from big families. <laughs> when I got to Notre Dame, the only way we could get the media to even come to our games was if we had their kid in the halftime show. But things have really changed. Now we have sellout crowds. We've got the best fans in America. Our kids get about 10 pairs of shoes. We have three different sets of uniforms, practice clothes. We do their laundry. We charter flights out east. We're on national television. And it's quite a difference. And Title IX is what did all of that for women. But we're still a little bit behind. And wouldn't it be great if the next generation of women had more than a 30% chance of playing for a female coach in high school or more than a 15% chance of playing for a female or working for a female administrator in college? Maybe someday we will have a woman president. Probably not at Notre Dame. <laughs> I think we have a much better chance of getting one in the White House than under the Golden Dome. But one of the things that's made it so difficult for women is the way society views us. We expect a woman to be compassionate, nurturing, and sweet. We don't expect them to be ambitious, driven, and competitive. Well, I've never been compassionate, nurturing, or sweet. And I have always been driven and competitive. I was quite the tomboy. In fact, my mom was always a little worried about that. And she was forever trying to get me to carry a purse, something I still don't do, and put ribbons in my hair. Well, I didn't get how that was going to change the fact that it was always me and nine guys down at the playground, and they weren't wearing bows in their hair. And I thought, well, things didn't get too much better, because when I first got to Notre Dame, I was in a golf outing. It was me and 143 men. Needless to say, I won the ladies' division. <laughs> but while the men were getting prizes of a new putter and golf balls and golf shirts, I was given the prize of bubble bath. My mom would have applauded that prize. But things have still gotten better, but I think it's still a man's world, and we're still trying to find our seat at the table. But sometimes I think as women, we're our own worst enemies. We don't network like men do. We spend too much time measuring ourselves against each other instead of helping to succeed. But society created those stereotypes. We had to fight through so many barriers. When we finally got to the top, where's the old girls network? Where is the network for women? There's still a sense of competition among us that we can't seem to shake. And while men are out on the golf course meeting people and trying to figure out how a guy they just met can help them get ahead, women are just looking at each other, assessing each other and what they're wearing. Men don't care as much about what they're wearing. In fact, they think they look pretty good all the time. <laughs> My husband can be ready to go out in five minutes, whether we're going to a formal dinner or to the movies. He goes in his closet, he makes one decision, khakis or dress pants. And he has never once asked me if his butt looked big in either pair. <laughs> so men are sitting at sporting events, they're meeting people that are gonna help them. They're not afraid to use them. Women, we're waiting for an offer, for an opportunity. Men are knocking down the door. When I have an opening on my staff, if I get 100 resumes, 70 of them will be from men, some of whom co coached fifth and sixth grade CYO, some of whom never coached, all of them dead sure that they are the person I need to hire. Women are not so sure. We tend to be overqualified before we apply for jobs. While men don't even need to read the job description, they already know they can do it. I think the thing I want to teach my players is confidence. I want them to have a swagger when they're on the court. I want them to learn how to battle and compete, because that's how you get to the top. I don't want them to just think they're good. I want them to believe that they're good. And I want everybody around them to see that. Because the way that you see yourself has everything to do with how the world sees you. It takes having success for some women to gain confidence, but we still have to build them up. Men seem to be born with it. I have never had a player that thought she was better than she was. But if you go on any Division I campus and ask their men's team how many of you will play professionally, just about every one of them will raise their hand, including the guys at the end of the bench that never play. As a coach, there's four things I want to teach these young women before they leave Notre Dame. The first is, you have to define success in your own terms. To me, success is looking in the mirror and liking what you see. So tonight when you go home, take a look in the mirror and ask yourself, what are your strengths? What do you see? What does success mean to you? And then ask yourself, what do other people see when they look at you? 
You know, they say some people can brighten a room just by entering it. Some people do it when they leave. <laughs> Which one are you? <laughs> what do you want to be the legacy that you leave behind? I gave my team a chance to do this. I said, you're Jimmy Stewart, it's a wonderful life. You're no longer a part of our team. What do you want your teammates to say about you? And they thought about it for a few minutes, and of course, nobody talked about points or stats or wins or losses. They all wanted to talk about a caring person. Uh, I was a good teammate, I was a good leader, I was a hard worker. I was always there for them. And then my point guard came along and she said, when my teammates look down at me in my coffin, I want them to say, hey look, she's moving. <laughs> We all have a different definition of success, so don't let people judge you by their definition. Every year I meet with my players individually and I ask them, what is their goal for the season? What do they want to accomplish? What's going to make them happy? What will be a successful season for them? And they all have different ideas and usually they have a goal, they set them for themselves because I think it's really important to have the goal to talk about it so that you're accountable. After I meet with them individually, we have a group meeting and I go around the team and I tell each person in front of their teammates, these are the three things you need to do for us to be successful. I like to do it in front of their teammates because it does make them accountable. And I might tell three people, you need to lead the team in rebounding. Or three people, you need to get to the free throw line more than anybody else on the team. Tell five people, you need to be in the top three in scoring. And I do that because I want them to compete. I have a team of really nice girls. They are very, very nice. And I have to teach them that competition is good, that rising to the challenge is what makes you grow. A little conflict can be a good thing. I think the thing most lacking in our society is a lack of accountability, whether it's politics, sports, or really any area. If a kid gets a bad grade in school, it's the teacher's fault. If your daughter doesn't play, it's the coach's fault. So I want my player to be able to take an honest look at themselves and look at their work ethic, their commitment. Are they working as hard as the rest of their teammates? Because there's sacrifice involved if you want to get to the top and you've got to be willing to pay the price. I think women generally, we're hard on ourselves. Ask a woman what her strengths are, she may be able to come up with one. But ask a man, take a seat, honey, it's going to take a while. <laughs> I let my players critique themselves uh, in our year-end meeting because I think it's great for them to have that chance, but generally, they have a very short list of what they do well. I always begin with, what were you happy with? What were you most proud of this year? And they have a, a short list of that and a much longer list of what they need to work on over the summer. But I love when they set their goals high and they're not afraid to say them out loud because I think that's how you start to become confident. I'm trying to groom them as leaders because when they, what they learn on the court is gonna have so much impact in their careers. I want them to be successful individually, but success as a team is so easy to judge. You look at our one loss record, you look at our NCAA tournament history, and you say, yeah, they had a good year. But really, you have to look at what you overcame to get there. The media judges coaches by their one loss record, but you know, you can't believe everything you read in the paper, unless Christine Brennan wrote it. <laughs> I was asked one time what my husband did for a living, and he was a really good salesman. I wanted to make him sound good, so I said, he's a dynamite salesman. And the next day in the paper, and her husband sells explosives. <laughs> I don't think women define success the same way that men do. And that's a good thing, because you know when you get to heaven, God's not gonna ask you how much money you made or how many trophies you won. She's gonna wanna know <laughs> if you made a difference in someone's life. As coaches, we can make a difference, and it doesn't always show up in the box score. It's about graduation rates, community involvement, and the success they have in their careers. Those are the things that I want them to learn. The second thing is, life is a journey. Enjoy the ride, but buckle up, because it's gonna be bumpy. There will be ups and downs, wins and losses, and I think we learn a lot more from the losses than we do from the wins. How you handle adversity, whether it's an injury, or maybe you're just the kid at the end of the bench that didn't get to play much. Learning to deal with adversity is gonna teach you some great life lessons. I've had so many former players come back and say, I hit some adversity in my life, the death of a parent, the birth of a special needs child, somebody was diagnosed with breast cancer, and they all thought that what they did on the court and the mental toughness that they learned really helped them get through those things. I think one of the toughest things women still deal with is having a career and a family and not feeling guilty for choosing one over the other. I missed a few games that my son played in, 
And looking back, I don't think it's such a bad thing for a child to know that they're not always going to be the center of attention for us. Just make the most of the time you have together. Enjoy the people in your life, because life is short. Each day is a gift. So don't live as if you expect to be 100. It's later than you think. The third thing is, life isn't fair, so don't expect it to be. The NBA has better TV ratings and better attendance than the WNBA. The average salary in the WNBA is less than $70,000 a year, where the NBA's average salary is $2.3 million. Men's college basketball gets a lot more attention. They have bigger crowds. They make more money in the NCAA tournament. In the NCAA tournament for men, each game, the conference gets $1.5 million for each team that is in each game. So each round advances. By the time they get to the Final Four, they're upwards of $7.5 million. We've been in the Final Four four straight years. You could add them together or multiply them, and you still get the same answer, zero. We get nothing. Is it fair? Not really. Can we change it? Probably not in my lifetime. But we do need to keep fighting to try to close that gap. When you play on a team, you find out pretty quickly what your role is going to be. Everybody has a role to play. Everybody doesn't get to be the hero at the end. Everybody can't be the leading scorer or the MVP, but everyone's job is important. So no matter what your role is, you got to be the best at it. I think some of the greatest unhappiness we have in our life is when we compare ourselves to others. One of my favorite quotes is, blowing out somebody else's candle doesn't make your light shine any brighter. All most people really want is to feel like they're a part of it. So everyone in our program from top to bottom needs to know that we couldn't be successful without them. People need to learn that playing a small part of something big is just as important as playing that starring role. So accept the fact that life isn't fair, because by the time that some people realize it, they haven't learned the skills to cope with adversity. Bad things happen in sports, season and career-ending injuries, coaches leave, players transfer. We need to use it as a teachable moment. Because life isn't always smooth sailing, and when you hit that first bump in the road, you've got to be prepared for it. The last thing I want to teach him is to have a positive attitude. Success in life is all about making good choices, so choose to be positive. You can't succeed in life without a positive attitude. One of the most exciting things is we get to, every day, wake up and reinvent ourselves. No matter what happened yesterday, today's a new day. It's never too late to become who you wanted to be. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day as to the attitude we choose for that day. We can't change the past. We can't change the inevitable. We can't change the fact that some people will react in a certain way. We can do the one thing that we can count on, and that's our attitude. Life is 10% what happens to me and 90% how I react to it. So make it a point to be a mentor for women. Reach behind you and help a woman climb the ladder. And tonight, when you look in the mirror, my wish for you is that you like what you see. I'm going to leave you with this quote. When you were born, you cried and the world rejoiced. Live your life so that when you die, the world cries and you rejoice. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. I think we have time for a few questions. Got a couple of microphones on the side. Yep. Questions? Questions, anyone? Coach, thank you very much. You alluded to this, and Christine Brennan talked about it this morning, um, that an increasing number of the coaching positions in the women's game are being taken or being filled with men. Christine made a point of saying all your coaches, your assistant coaches, are, are women. Can you talk a little bit about you know, how you, um, your philosophy uh, about that? Yeah, my philosophy has changed a little bit. I, I, I did have men on my staff in the past. I, I tried to have a token guy uh, <laughs> every year. I thought in some ways, I thought it's great to know that a woman can be the boss. And that's a, that's a pretty good role model that we want to see also. But 
eventually, so many men have gotten into our game. Uh, the women's salaries have really increased. When Title IX first came in, 90% of teams were coached by women, and now we're under 50%. So I think it's really important for me uh, to be a role model in that way and to hire more women. And we would love to see more coaches do that. We had two teams in the Final Four that had all female staffs. And, uh, and it's a great thing. Um, you know, we, we would just think more women are qualified. I think they're hesitant to apply for jobs and they need to uh, really have the confidence and go after them. Anyone else? Right over here. Hi, thank you so much for the talk. This was amazing. Um, I have a question. So given that basketball is one of the few sports where we have more racial diversity, um, how do you approach making sure that, or how do you approach coaching um, students from different racial backgrounds or class backgrounds if, if it's intentional? I think it's really important. When I first came to Notre Dame, uh, we had one African American on our team and uh, you know, in the last probably 10 years, we usually have a majority of our players are African American. I have two coaches on my staff, um, so they have somebody they feel like they can relate to. Um, we have four people on our staff, and I don't care who the players talk to, I just want them to talk to somebody. I think it's important that you, you have the people that your players are comfortable with, somebody that, that can really understand what they're talking about. Um, I have young people on my staff so they can relate to the players, they speak their language, they understand uh, the social media aspects of things. Um, I, I think it's really key that you have a staff like that and I see a lot of staffs that don't have the diversity on them and I don't see how you can attract players for that if you don't have the diversity on your staff. And at the university, I think that's one of the things that I think Notre Dame can do a better job of is having more diversity in their administration. Oops, we um, taping this? Coach, uh, question here. <laughs> I'm gonna ask this question for Abby. She lost her voice, so I'm gonna ask it for her. Her question is, what do you look for in a recruit besides just being a good basketball player? Yeah, the, the basketball is a, a small part of it. For, the first thing we do is get the transcript. That is very important for us. We, we need to have a, a pretty high caliber student uh, to go to Notre Dame. But after that, it becomes a lot of intangible things. I'm looking for competition. I want somebody that wants to compete. I want somebody that hates to lose. Uh, I really, really think that's important. I don't think you can teach the work ethic. I think you have to have it. So I like to see them play a really close game. I like to see them lose a game. I like to see how they react when somebody scores on them. Uh, do, they, do they run it right back and try to get it back? Um, do they care if somebody scores on them? You know, what, what is their relationship with their teammates? Do their teammates seem to respect them? Do they respect their teammates? Are they a leader on the floor? Are they somebody that communicates with their teammates? Because we want leaders. We want people that are good team players. I think that's really important. Of course, for us, the unselfish part is really important. We want somebody that's not going to shoot the ball every time they touch it. We want them to be in a team. And lately, we've been looking at winners. We're looking at kids that won their state high school tournament. Uh, teams that, people that play on teams that win, they just, they have a, a mental toughness and they know how to win. And that makes it a lot easier. So we've got probably I think of the freshman class, we have three freshmen coming in, two of them are state champions, uh, one of them's a USA gold medal winner. So it's really important to us to look really at the whole package. When they come on campus, I look at how they treat their parents because that's how they're going to treat me. And uh, you know, if they've got their hand out wondering what they're going to get, give me the credit card, I'm going to the bookstore, it's not what we want. Um, we were really selective and then we ask our players, how did you like them? Do you think they'll fit in? And if they give us the thumbs up, that's when we offer them the scholarship. Who or what is your inspiration? Uh, I would say my mom is, is probably my inspiration. She is uh, an amazing woman who's been through a lot in her life, and uh, she, she inspires me every day. Well, you're already a great role model, but don't you think it'd be an even better role model if you never lost to a team coached by a man? <laughs> That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Um, let me get the knife out of my back. Hold on a second. Um, yeah, I, I can't even say anything. I mean, they, they are a great team, and uh, that one still hurts, so I'm still working on getting up. Can we have another question? Uh, I, I'm a, I love the women's game, um, but I'm wondering, if you look at the men's game, 
Do you take anything out of that and put it into your uh, philosophy or the way you coach or the way you play the game? Absolutely. You know, I, I, I love the women's game, too. I was watching ESPN Classic, and I saw an old game Larry Bird was playing, and it resembled the women's game to me. It was not a lot of dunking. It was just it was great basketball, moving the ball, a lot of good shots. Um, and so I, I think that's where we are, you know, where the, where the men were in the 70s. But I do look at the men's game. I, what I like to do, we run the Princeton offense, and uh, Pete Carroll invented that at Princeton. And so I went around and talked to, uh, I started with the Bill Carmody at Northwestern. I talked to him about the offense. Um, you know, we, we go out and talk to different coaches about things we want to run. We were running the triangle office. I went to uh, watch the Bulls practice, and everybody, you know, wanted to know what, what was Michael Jordan like. And I was like, I got to talk to Phil Jackson. Who cares about Michael Jordan? Um, you know, Tex Winter invented the offense. I mean, I, I was, it was, uh, you know, I go to the ACC meetings and all these Hall of Fame men's coaches, and uh, that's all I wanted to do was pick their brains about what are you doing in the summer? What do your workouts look like? You're working on offense, defense, you're scrimmaging. What, you know, what are you doing? So I gain a lot from, uh, from the men's programs. Thank you for your inspirational talk tonight. I would like to know a little bit more about developing competitiveness between your women. When you talk about goal setting, and you said you want four people to achieve the same goal that maybe only one or two can. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with when it appears there's conflict on your team? I love conflict. <laughs> I really, really like it. I, I think women are afraid of it. We had two great guards this year, Kayla McBride and Jewel Lloyd. And when we would do drills, I would put them against each other rather than on the same team, even though they're both starters. And they would go at it, and there would be no fouls called. And we would just let them really battle it out and, and see who won. And I think some of the players are a little uneasy with that. I think it's so important that you really, you just make it known right away, we're, we're going. We're not blowing any whistles and we're gonna go. Every drill we do is competitive. We either keep score or time. There's always a winner and there's always a loser and the losers don't get medals or ribbons. It's, it's losers run and the winners stay on. You know, we play make it, take it if we're doing offense. Um, there's a lot of things that you can do as a coach to really ramp up the intensity of practice and, uh, and I think that starts with the coach. So I can bring the intensity. Yes, I can. <laughs> Anyone else right here? I'd like to ask you how you work with or deal with the challenge of keeping up with your own precedent. You have set such a high bar for your team. Um, what is it like to keep that going over time? It's, it's difficult. I talked to Lou Holtz about that last year. Um, and, and he talked about, you know, they won the national championship and the next year they were kind of satisfied because they won. And so I guess it was good we didn't win. We couldn't be satisfied. Um, but so, you know, he talked about how you have to constantly maintain the intensity, but you have to keep raising it up a little bit more. Um, you know, last year we lost in the semifinal. This year we lost in the final. I mean, when you lose, it doesn't really matter to me what, when your season's over. But I, I think it's really, really difficult because you stop enjoying the victories along the way. You put the more pressure on yourself. The expectation for our fans in South Bend now is that we're going to go to the Final Four. We've gone four years in a row. Each class would come in, and I would say, you guys, you have no idea how hard this is. You have no idea. You're just along for the ride. You're just coming and expecting because Skyler's here, and we're going to the Final Four, and then Skyler graduated, and we go back to the Final Four. And, um, you know, it was really, it was a, a really good achievement for us because we, we were thinking that they just didn't know what they had to do and now we've lost more players and so the pressure's on you know we're, we're going to be ranked high again and I think it's hard when you can't enjoy the victories and so for me one of my goals is always you gotta you gotta enjoy it you gotta celebrate the victories and try to be positive and and not look because we're so used to looking at the negative and seeing what they can't do what they didn't do well you know we won by 20 yeah we could have won by 30 we, we should have you know and I think it's really important to to step back and to just really be happy uh, with the wins. And you saw our team this year in the, in the tournament. It was really interesting because we had a very business-like approach. We went undefeated through the regular season. We won the ACC tournament. They've got balloons and confetti falling down from the sky. You know, we have one moment of excitement. I look over, and there's my team huddled up around our captain. And she's saying, we got the NCAA tournament, so don't, let's not get too high about this one. And then we won the first round. And they were like, yay, won the second round. OK, good. 
third round. You know, it wasn't until we got to the regional final and won that that they finally showed a little, a little excitement. But I think they're on a mission, and and I, I kind of like that business-like attitude. But I think we can enjoy the victories a little bit more. Next year, I'll enjoy every one of them because we're not going to meet that many. Oh, let's turn that tape off. That's uh, it's really inhibiting me. I could probably hear you. Oh, sorry. Coach, thanks for everything. Um, have you had any issues with GLBT athletes that uh, you could share your experience with? I'm sorry, what'd you say? Uh, GLBT athletes, any gay, lesbian, bi, oh, sorry. transgendered <laughs> athletes? You know, I don't know if you know, we, we just put out a video uh, at Notre Dame, an all-inclusion uh, type of video. It's really good. All of the teams uh, got involved. Uh, one of our tennis players came out this year, and uh, and you know, kind of after that, we went ahead and and did something that said we are, um, you know, as a Catholic institution, never sure what what people are thinking, but we we wanted everyone to know that um, it's okay with us. Uh, we we're behind you. We support you 100%. Um, we we would like everybody to be honest and say whatever they feel. Uh, we have not had a problem with that, and I was really proud of Notre Dame for, you know, for a Catholic school to come out and do something like that. I thought that was really good. So we feel like we're we're on a good place in a good place and I don't think any other school has really ever done anything like that so it's great to be in the forefront of an important issue like that. <sighs> I'm sorry, did you say in our conference? <laughs> um, we, you know, uh, Connecticut is the is the toughest team on our schedule. They're the best team in the country. In the in the ACC, which I think is the best league in women's basketball, there's a lot of good teams. Uh, we had three teams in the final eight, two in the final four. Uh, Duke is really good. Uh, there's just every team is really good. So I, I think it's great. But the rivalry we have with UConn is I think the best in the country. It's a it's a great game. It's better when we win, but it's still a, a pretty good rivalry. What do you look for in the individual to make them the appropriate choice? You know, we let the team vote, and then I count them. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we both kind of get what we want. I, I think there's some years when, you know, we have a player like Skylar Diggins. She's going to be the captain, and it doesn't matter who's with her. She's going to be great. Natalie Chama was that person for us this year. Next year, we it's going to be interesting. We We don't really have a a true successor. So we talk to the girls about what does it mean to you? We, we have a thing where we, each of the girls writes a letter to the team. Uh, we started this week, once a week, somebody writes a letter. And in it, they talk about what, what is a leader to them? What are, what are they looking for in a leader? And then at the, uh, when we, they come back, we'll vote for captains. So we try to kind of plant seeds of what, what a leader is. And, uh, you know, I think it, you can help people become better leaders. I don't know that you can make them leaders if they don't have the personality. They have to be willing to have a voice. And girls want to be liked. They don't want to have to say tough things uh, to people. They just really want to be liked. They like harmony. And so that, that can make it difficult. So it's going to be interesting this year to see who emerges as our leader. So we do let the team vote for captains. Generally, they vote for the seniors no matter what. Um, so we try to encourage them to, to really look around the team and, and look at all the upperclassmen. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, I think coaching is really a tough job and it's, it's very time consuming. And how do you mentor the women that work for you and help them find the balance between family and coaching with all the travel and practice time and thinking and worrying and all that? <laughs> Finding a balance is really difficult. Uh, I give them uh, a lot of credit for what they go through because my staff, I've got um, one woman, Beth Cunningham. She is the mother of three children under the age of three. She just had twins. Uh, she was pregnant with twins all of last season, and she looked like she was exhausted all the time, but we, we didn't cut her any slack, in fact. <laughs> We were afraid the doctor wouldn't let her on the plane in the NCAA tournament because, you know, you can't fly in that last month, and uh, she was due in early May. But, you know, the game would end. She would be sitting on the chair, and I'd say, all right, get ready. You got the next game. And she didn't miss a beat. I mean, she was, she was great. My other assistant is a single mom. She's got a, an 11-year-old. Uh, I have another assistant who has a 
three-year-old. So we've got a lot of kids uh, around, and, and they help each other. And fortunately, uh, like in my case, I had a great husband who did everything. Uh, it, was, it was so great for me to be able to lean on him to make dinner and, and do some laundry and do things like that. And it was funny because my son went on a sleepover, and he came back, and he said, Mom, you're not going to believe this. His mom cooks. <laughs> So we, we had a complete role reversal, and my assistant with the three kids, her husband's the same. He's great. I mean, it, it, takes, it takes a lot, and the travel really is tough. You know, it wears on you. We're fortunate we're able to charter, so we, get, you know, we can get out and back uh, in a pretty good amount of time. But recruiting takes a lot of time away from home, and it's, it's a balancing act, and you really, you really have to be committed to do it. Sometimes I think we should be committed. <laughs> Coach... Oops. Um, what sort of a role do you think the media plays in the portrayal of the women in sports and what their role is supposed to be? I think they play a huge role. I think they determine uh, what people think. I, I think when they're watching a the game and they say, this is the best team or this is the best player or um, she's, you know, she should be the rookie of the year or the player of the year, I think they have tremendous power. And, and I'm not sure that, that that's what we want. Uh, I think it would be great to see a, kind of a neutral cast of, of announcers sometimes, but I, I think they do. They play a pivotal role. I think they can make or break a player, and it's uh, in our game when, you know, select games are on TV, you see one team a lot more than, than others. I think that's, um, that puts in people's mind, this is the best team because they're always on. This is the team I know about the most because I always see them on TV. I hear the announcers talking about them even when I'm watching another game. Uh, they're talking about this other team. So uh, I think the announcers play a, a really big role and uh, it's, it's um, still being taped. So I'm, I think there's some really good ones out there, but uh, <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you're from Philly. You know, you just speak out your mind. Yeah, I, I never root for the underdog in women's basketball. I, I, uh, I don't think there is parity in the women's game because the players continue to want to go to the top school, you know, and, and that, that makes it hard to have parity. We just, there's just not enough good players to go around. In the men's side, you've got a lot of players that can change the game. On the women's side, we've got maybe the top um, two or three. I mean, I, I had the National Rookie of the Year. She was ranked fourth coming in. She's really good. But, you know, under five from five to 25, they're, they're not people that if we even could go pro, we wouldn't. Uh, in the women's game, you have to stay four years. You can't go pro. But we don't have those game-changing people at the top like the men had, the one-and-done guys. Uh, they, they can change the game. And across the board, there's, there's just really good men's players out there. So I think for us, it's, um, it's a shame because I think, I think it does create interest. I think this year was a, a, you know, there was a lot of interest in the Final Four. I think that people know uh, some teams and they want to follow them and they want to see them. Uh, I'm not sure if people would pay to see two unknown teams in the Final Four. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there's arguments that it's good for the game to have, I'd like to see at least one other team in the Final Four than uh, the one we have to play every year. That would, that would be nice. But, you know, I, I think, you know, they're, it's good for the game to have a team that everybody knows about too. Any other questions? No, you know, I, I think the WNBA is so much of a business. I, I don't like that. To me, it's the chemistry and the camaraderie. Um, I, I love being on a college campus. I love seeing the growth of a player who comes in as a freshman and she's all wide-eyed and shy. And, and then as a senior, she's going out and doing great interviews and, and making us proud of, of Notre Dame. So I, I really I like that part of seeing them grow and helping them grow. Uh, I think in the WNBA, it's, it's all about the money. And um, it's, it's not as much a team game to me as um, about the individuals. I just had a quick uh, follow-up to, sorry, right here in the middle, oh. straight back in front gotcha. of the taping. Um, <laughs> I just had a quick follow-up to kind of what you're talking, there's not that many game changers out there, and um, actually, 
reading the book that you wrote after your first national championship. And in the first chapter there, you talked about how you didn't offer all of your scholarships. Wondering now, 10 years later, after that, 10, 12 years later, is, are you still kind of following that same philosophy of not offering all those scholarships? And also, you know, out there recruiting, you know, how many players are you looking at every year and to fill that, you know, a limited, you know, three or four scholarships each year? I'm probably one of the slower coaches to offer a scholarship. There's a lot of coaches that'll see a kid play in eighth or ninth grade and call the coach and say, we'd like to offer. Uh, they've never even spoken to them. And, and that I, I couldn't understand that because I need to get to know somebody to know if I want to coach them and if, I, if they'll fit in with what we want to do. So I have a a small pool. I'm really, really picky. Uh, my assistants will come back from seeing a player. She's really good, but you're not going to want to coach her. So, we, you know, we just cross them off the list because we, we look for those intangible things. So I do like to have a smaller team. Um, we probably were only looking at about six juniors. We've got two committed. Um, so we've got a, a couple left. We, we're going to take two or three. And each year the, the pool is, is pretty small. But I'd like to have a small team because I, I like to keep them happy if I can. Um, you spoke earlier about how um, the Notre Dame team and, and actually a lot of the top level women's teams are being treated much better than they were in the past, and, but yet there's still a lack of equality in, in many respects. So I was just wondering if you could speak to some of the critical battles that you have personally fought uh, in your journey to get to the point where you are in, uh, in order to advocate for women's sports and girls' sports and athletics. You know, I, I had to advocate for my staff with salaries. I think that was a really important issue for us, uh, just being able to hire the, the staff. Uh, we didn't have the same number of positions that the men had, so we were able to add those. And, uh, and you know, I, I think our administration has done a much better job as they're really good, in fact, at looking at the salaries nationwide to, to make sure my assistants are being taken care of. Um, just to have those positions, to have the facilities, the locker room were identical to the men. Um, I, I think that was a long time in coming. When I started and the men would be practicing and then they'd be heading to the plane to you know, fly somewhere and we'd be busing to that same exact place. Uh, I think there were some little things like that. Who was working with our team, the support staff in those areas that were really critical uh, because it's not it's not the big things, sometimes it's the little things. And just having the right sports information person, having the trainer that can be with you full time. Uh, so there were so many people in the support area that I think we had to really work to get on par with the men. We have time for one more question. One more, right up here. No pressure, it's gotta be a good one though. <clears throat> I'm sure it varies, but how do you close? You have somebody that you really want to come to Notre Dame. How do you close it? for a player that you really want? I say, if you want to be good, go someplace else. If you want to be great, come to Notre Dame. Who's coming? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Muffet. Uh, a very inspirational talk. I was uh, quite impressed with uh, her comments about character and character building, and I think that transcends things uh, beyond sports. A few um, uh, announcements that I'd like to make. Uh, we're going to continue on with the conference with a film screening, a documentary entitled Media Coverage in Female Athletes, put together by the folks from the Tucker Center at the University of Minnesota, and that will be taking place at the Dudley uh, Birder Hall uh, up the street. Um, tomorrow, we will be together uh, at Lambeau Field, and events will take place up in the Legends Room, Legends Room, and, and there's construction taking place uh, over in the Lambeau Field area. So we ask that you enter into the atrium uh, using the Oneida Nations Gate and there will be plenty of signs and people giving directions that will lead you upstairs to the Legends Room. There'll be a registration table next to the escalators, and we have a couple of panel discussions taking place tomorrow. One of them will involve um, female athletes, um, and another one will involve coaches, and our uh, session will conclude with an address by Dr. Julia Chase Brand, the pioneering distance runner, 
with all of that at Lambeau Field tomorrow. And, and the day will conclude then for those of you who are on tap for tours of Lambeau Field. And so uh, we're expecting to enjoy that, that day at Lambeau tomorrow. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank again our sponsors, the, the Center for Ethical Youth and Coaching and the International Sports Professional Association for contributing to make this event possible. So we will see you either at the Birder Hall or uh, at Lambeau Field tomorrow. I hope you've enjoyed today's activities and uh, good night. I told you my